Well, turn in your Bible or your phone, your tablet to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we're going to read verses 37 through 47. Um, The context of this, since we're just jumping into a passage, is Peter has just preached this incredible sermon at Pentecost, and he has described the history leading up to Lord Jesus Christ and, and his life and his death, his ministry, his resurrection, and said, you need to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The one that you crucified is the creator and your redeemer. That was his sermon. And the verses that we'll read are the response to Peter's sermon. So verses 37 through 47 of Acts chapter 2. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and they were, they were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit would use it to instruct us in our faith. Instruct us in the gospel this morning. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. This morning, can you think of a time recently when you believed something that was not true? Can you think of a time recently when you believed something that was not true? It might have been something very silly, something that wasn't that serious. For example, maybe you were watching TV or maybe you were watching something on YouTube and an ad came up and you thought for a second, you believed the advertisement and you thought, you know what? 15 minutes could save me 15% on my car insurance. Maybe you believe that on an advertisement. Maybe it's something more serious. Maybe you believe something more serious. Maybe a a friend or uh, maybe a student at school, maybe a coworker, told you something about a mutual friend. Did you know about this? And you believed it. I can't believe that actually happened. I can't believe that person would do that. And then it turns out, you find out a week later, a month later, that it wasn't true. It was just a rumor. It was just gossip. It was just something false. And you believed it about that person, and you began to think differently until you realized it wasn't true. I think each of you maybe can think of a time when you believed something that just was not true. There was a writer, a theologian from a generation ago, and he passed away, and he said there's a fundamental lie. He called it a cultural myth that each of us Each of you is tempted to believe. And I think, as I read about it recently, I thought this is still, I think, the biggest, he wrote this a generation ago, this is still probably the biggest cultural lie or cultural myth that you and I are tempted to believe, and tempted to believe in 2017 as we start a new year. And it's this, he said this, it is the myth of self-fulfillment, that you can be completely fulfilled if you just have And each of you fill in the blank. It might be success. It might be money. It might be personal image. It might be health. It might be whatever it might be. The myth of self-fulfillment, that if you just have that one thing you're missing right now in your life, then you're going to be happy. You're going to be content. You're going to be satisfied. Everything will be great. He called it the myth of the modern world. And I think daily you and I are tempted to believe that, that that one thing we're missing could make our lives perfect, and we'll have everything. If we take that myth a step further, the myth of self-fulfillment, it means this practically. It means that you're going to use other people in your life to reach that goal of self-fulfillment. 
Other people will become a means to your own selfish end if you're believing that lie. And so other people become a way you can achieve your goals. Other people become the, the means to the end of your own life. And I think that really is, as we kind of look at the year ahead, I think that is the biggest myth, the biggest lie that you and I are tempted to believe. Even in a church, even as, as I mean, as Christians trying to follow the Lord, it, there is that lie of, if I just have that one thing I'm missing right now, in addition to what I have in Christ, then I'll be fulfilled. And so this morning I want to talk about that in light of what is the fundamental truth that you should believe in 2017 as we begin the new year. And the fundamental truth involves worshiping the triune God, worshiping the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so this morning what I want to do is we're going to look at the verses we just read from Acts chapter 2. And I want you to see three basic truths from Acts chapter 2. The first is this. It's going to be seeing the purpose of worship. The purpose of worship. Why we worship. The motives for worship. Second of all, we're going to see the practice of worship. What does worship look like? How how do we actually worship the Lord in a way that honors Him? So we're going to look at the practice, the purpose of worship, the practice, and then finally, we're going to see what's the product of worship? What does it produce? What happens when we worship, and then ultimately, what happens after we worship? So that's what I want us to see in Acts chapter 2, the purpose, the practice, and then the product of biblical worship. So first, let's begin with the purpose of, of worship. In our text this morning from Acts chapter 2, Paul, or Peter rather, just preached this amazing sermon about the life, the ministry, the death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Peter announced that all of his hearers need to repent and put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the same message we preach and we teach at Shem Creek Presbyterian Church, that we find peace with God through forgiveness and forgiveness through the Lord Jesus Christ. The writer here, Luke, tells us that when the audience heard Peter's words, it says they were cut to the heart. In other words, the word there, they were stabbed. They were pierced to the heart by the spiritual truth that they heard. Because... Like you and I, they they had a sense of their personal sin, that they were needing a Savior. And they also had a sense of the transcendence, the holiness of the triune God, that He was much greater than them. And so they were cut to the heart, and it says awe or fear came upon them because they knew that they were not worthy of the message that they had actually heard. And so they were pierced to their heart because of their need. And that led to repentance. It led to faith in Jesus Christ. And because of that, Luke tells us in this text that their sins were forgiven. Their sins were forgiven, and the presence of the Holy Spirit was given them. And those are the the same gospel promises that you received this morning, that your sins are forgiven if you repent and put your faith in Christ, and you do have the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life today and tomorrow and Tuesday and Wednesday. And so as we look here, that is the purpose of worship today, just as it was 2,000 years ago with Peter. The motivation for worship is the same this morning at Shem Creek Presbyterian Church as it was with Peter and the apostles. It's that motivation that you have that sense of your sin and your guilt, but you also have a sense that there is a holy and a gracious God who is willing to forgive you, an infinite God who will forgive you of your sins. And so worship is fueled by that sense, that knowledge of the worth of God above everything, because you realize you're not worthy of Him, but you're in desperate need of the presence of God in your life. Worship means you're going to value the Lord Jesus Christ and what he's done for you through his death and resurrection more than a job promotion, more than staying in shape and and developing good self-image and promotion, more than pleasant vacations and the success of your kids. Above all those things, you're going to value the triune God. That's what worship means, valuing him above everything, knowing the glory and majesty of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so worship, as we Look at why we worship. It's, it's not just sitting through, uh, maybe depending on your background or your context, sitting through a, a traditional service where there are prayers, we stand, we sit, there's a confession, sitting through those kind of things and just getting through the what we might call the liturgy. It's also not going and just being entertained with loud music and, and a really um, relevant message that makes you become a better person. Those things are not worship, whether it's traditional or contemporary. Neither one of those things necessarily, or worship if you're just sitting through it. Worship ultimately is about 
knowing the presence of God, knowing his absolute worth above everything, and valuing him above everything, even the good things in your life that God has given you. And so worship is more than a traditional service or contemporary service, anything like that. It's more than personal preferences of songs you like, songs you don't like, sermons you like, sermons you don't like. It's about acknowledging the presence and the power of God and knowing his worth above everything else in your life, giving him the priority. And so that's the purpose of worship. And that's the why. That's knowing why we worship God and what leads us to worship. It's knowing that God is not just one segment of your life, one little piece of the pie of your life, but it's living with him as the center of your life and knowing that he impacts every area of your life, your family, your work, everything, recreation, every area of your life. And so that leads us to the practice of worship. Okay, we, we know from Acts chapter 2 why we should worship. We should repent, and believe, and put our faith in the Lord and value him. But how do we worship? What, what do we do on, on Sunday morning? The how of worship. And it, it's, it can be very confusing, especially in American culture, because even if you went down Coleman Boulevard or Johnny Dodds, there's traditional services where you, know, you might stand, sit, there might be candles, there might be smoke, there might be um, all kinds of different liturgies. And then you can also drive a little bit farther, and there can be a, a large church, and, and it's very loud, and um, uh, the pastor or whoever is probably not wearing a tie, and he's going to be very relevant and more stories and making it more about you. Um, so there's all different styles of worship. So how do we know what we're supposed to do on Sunday morning? How do we know it's biblical worship or what we might call reformed worship, worship in light of the Reformation? And so the answer really is, is more than preferences. The answer is very simple. The answer is, what does God's word teach us about worship? Because it doesn't really matter what I say or what Charlie says or what any pastor on Coleman or Johnny Dodd says. It's really, what does God's word say about how we should worship him? What has God told us? And we see here in, in Acts chapter 2, if you're, if you're taking notes, there are four things. There's four simple things that we are told about worship. The first one that we see is, Luke tells us they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were committed to correct doctrine. And if that sounds a little bit cold, there's another way of thinking of that. They were committed to thinking right thoughts about God. They wanted to think about God truly and accurately. We call that doctrine. You might call it theology. It's really just thinking correctly about who God is. And that, that's one reason in, in our tradition, in the Reformed tradition, and in, in, in our denomination, there's a history, several centuries, of being committed to thinking correct thoughts about God after him. Not what the culture might say about God, not what some guru um, who's got a following might say, but what does God's word say about the triune God? Because that's what we want to do. And, and it says they read, they studied the, the writings of Scripture to know who God was, and to think correctly about him, and to think clearly about him. And, and that's why as, as a church plan, as a new church, we want to study scripture. We want to study God's word and, and not just talk about this on one Sunday and talk about something else on another Sunday. And uh, they probably need to hear another tithing sermon, so we're going to talk about tithing. It's not that. It's what does God's word say about himself? Because that's the priority. And so we want to be committed to God's word. We want to read scripture every Sunday. We want to have the word preached every Sunday, so that we can think correct thoughts about God. So that's the first thing we see here. The second thing was that their teaching was accompanied by fellowship. And so they gathered together to worship the Lord. They didn't just worship the Lord privately and, and personally at, at their home or um, at their house. It was together. It was a corporate activity. I remember about four or five years ago, I was sitting with a young man um, on his dock one evening, and it was a beautiful low country evening, beautiful sunset, and we were sitting there talking. And I, I asked this young man, I said, how, is, you know, how are you doing? How's your family doing? Um, growing in the life of our church, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Give me some feedback. Let's, let's talk. And he said, you know what? And he said, sometimes I, I kind of doubt the need to put on a sport coat, maybe put on a tie, and show up Sunday morning with everybody else. He said, sometimes I don't really see the need to go and sit in the pew with my sport coat on and kind of go through the motions. Because he's like, look, we're sitting on this dock. It's a beautiful low country evening. I can sense the presence of God here. This is worship. And my response to him was, you know, this is, this is an, an act of personal worship, but 
Worship is not a, a, an individual sport, so to speak. Worship is a team sport. And to put it more directly, I said the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, he, he didn't die so that you could just worship him privately on your dock. He died for all of his people so they could worship him together. And as we gather on Sunday morning, on the first day of the week, celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is an anticipation of what we read in the final pages of Scripture, the final um, chapters of Revelation, the wedding feast of Christ and his church, where Christ and his people are gathered to celebrate our redemption that he has purchased for us. And so Sunday is a time to gather, not to stay at home and worship privately or to go out on the beach. And those are great things to do during the week and celebrate God's um, beautiful creation. But worship is something we do together. It is something where we need to come together and, and be together in worship and to be encouraged by seeing other Christians in worship as well. And so worship is something we do together. It's fellowship. It is together. So we've seen a couple things. Apostolic teaching. We've seen fellowship. The third thing we see is in verse 42. It says they were committed to prayers, to the prayers. And so they were committed to praying, meaning they were committed to communing with God, listening to God speak, talking to God. And so prayer is an important part of worship. Prayer is an important part of your life. It was um, encouraging to see, it was it last Friday, we had our second um, 24-hour concert of prayer, and many of you signed up to pray, and so we could see over our 24-hour period so many people here and people even in the U.K. praying for us in the middle of the night, praying for our church, praying for our city, praying for our town. And so prayer is, is important, personal prayer. But more important than that is public prayer, praying together. And that's why in our worship service, we want to have prayers throughout the service. Uh, so we have a prayer to confess our sins, which is important before we worship the Lord. We have a prayer, a pastoral prayer. We're praying for our church, praying for our people. We have the Lord's Prayer, which is a way to teach us in our prayer. It's a corrective. In case our prayers get too off to the right or too off to the left, we're going to pray what Christ taught us to pray. We also have a prayer um, before the Lord's Supper, inviting, asking the Holy Spirit to use the elements, the bread and the juice, to uh, spiritually strengthen us. Because unless the Holy Spirit works through the elements, it's, it, to put it bluntly, it's just a snack. But if the Holy Spirit's working through it, it is Christ being spiritually present. And that's a totally different thing. And so there's a prayer to ask the Holy Spirit to work through this. After the Lord's Supper, I pray. And that is a prayer of thanksgiving. It's thanking the Holy Spirit for working through these elements so that we don't take his ministry for granted and just assume that he's going to do that for us. We thank the Holy Spirit for his, his ministry. And so here in Acts 2, we see apostolic teaching, we see fellowship, and we see the prayers of the people. And then fourthly, the final thing we see in the practice is what I just alluded to, which is they observe the sacraments instituted by the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at verse 42, it says, the breaking of bread. And that's probably a reference to the Lord's Supper. It's a reference to communion, that when they gathered together to worship the Lord, they gathered and observed the sacrament that the bread and the wine, the juice, was a spiritual sign and seal of God's covenant promises. And so we want to do that when we meet each week to encourage us in the promises of Jesus Christ to his people. It's a sacrament of sanctification. It holds God's promises to you. Not what God might do if you have a good week and have good church attendance and all those things, but what God has promised to do to his people. And so we want to observe that. Second of all, verse 41, it says they baptized. Many were baptized. It looks like a few thousand. Um, they would have packed the Derby building if they were here, right? It would have been a lot of baptisms. We'd have to go out to the, um, to the harbor and baptize everybody. And you notice here they practiced baptism. It was connected with the forgiveness of sins in verse 38. And so the, the, the practice of baptism, of the pouring on of water, was a sign and a seal, a symbol of of just as when you're washed and, and any kind of dirt or anything that's on you that's polluting you is washed away, the sacrament of baptism shows us that spiritually we're clean through the work of the Holy Spirit, that he cleans us, and that we are forgiven. And that's what that sacrament is. And it's, as he tells us here in verse 39, that promise of, that we find in baptism is to you, and it's to your children. And so we want to celebrate baptism in the life of the church for adults and for infants of believing uh, Christians. And so here in Acts chapter 2, we see so much about the practice of worship. 
teaching, fellowship, prayer, sacraments. And that guides us in what we do as a church, as a young church, as a mission church, that we're committed to the Word of God, committed to the sacraments, committed to prayer and fellowship together. And so there we see a little bit of the practice of worship. Um, Last Monday night um, was a fun night of college football for many of y'all, the national championship. Uh, Might have been a stressful night for some of y'all, myself included. You might have been a little bit stressed out around 11, 11.30, midnight, and maybe pacing a little bit, not sure what was going to happen until until the final second uh, when Hunter Renfro caught it. Uh, So fun night, stressful night. Can't speak for Gamecock fans. I don't know how that night was if you're a Gamecock fan, but it was a big night. And if you watched it, I mean, after, the, after they scored the touchdown, they won. Uh, it was, it was, for me, at least, it was a little bit hard to turn the TV off because you saw all these Clemson fans celebrating orange everywhere. I mean, it's been, it's been a while. It's been 35 years. <laughs> uh, I mean, Danny Ford is not, I mean, he was a young man uh, when that happened. It's been a long time. But after the game, you saw so many people celebrating in the stands, orange everywhere on the field. And as you watch the aftermath of the game, there was this unity of Clemson fans everywhere, uh, at least you know, on the TV, celebrating this achievement that they're the number one team. They were celebrating this accomplishment of beating, beating a team that hadn't lost in a couple of years. I mean, I think Alabama won 26 straight, something like that. I mean, it was a huge accomplishment. And there was this unity built on the football team and built around the success of the team. The final element of worship we learn about here is what is the the product of worship? What is it worship leads to? And it leads to unity. Just as you saw so much unity after after the national championship game for Clemson fans, they were celebrating what had happened, the success. Worship is a celebration of the person of Jesus Christ and what he's accomplished, which is infinitely greater than a national championship. What he's accomplished is your redemption from sin and from death on the cross. And so the product of worship is a unity of God's people, a unity around not a personality, not a preference for worship, not oh, we really like this guy or we like this person. It's a unity around the person of Christ and his work on your behalf at the cross. It's, it's true unity, not unity because we talk alike or look alike or have the same preferences and like certain stuff. It's not unity just for the sake of unity because we don't want to fight people on Sunday. It's unity around the gospel of Jesus Christ, what he's done. And worship unites us around that and unites us around the announcement, the proclamation of what he has done for you on your behalf. It's built on the person of Christ. And you see that practically here in Acts 2 in several ways. They're united in worship together. They're united in eating meals together. They're united in prayers together. They're united even, this is a little bit scary, in their possessions together. It says they sold their possessions and provided for everyone according to their need. And finally, I don't want you to miss this. We'll come back to this in two weeks. They were united when they left worship. They were united when they left worship. They were united in their mission of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ in their community. And Luke tells us here at the end, he says, The Lord added daily to their number those who were putting their faith in Jesus Christ and being saved from the punishment of their sins. And so as they left worship, they were united in mission. And we'll talk about that in a couple weeks. They were united in what their purpose was. And so before we move on, just reflect for a moment. Think about how our unity in worship could lead to your friends, students at school, coworkers, putting their faith in Christ. And the Lord would add daily to the number of people being saved in Mount Pleasant and in Charleston and Johns Island, West Ashley, Park Circle, Cane Hoy, all the areas around here that our unity in worship might lead to a gospel mission in the community. And so there's a unity from worship that brings us together, a unity around the truth of Scripture. And that truth is this, that God is good, and He has brought salvation. He has provided salvation for His people. And on top of that, it's free. You don't earn it. You don't work hard to accomplish it. You don't do something to achieve it. God gives it to you. You receive it by faith in the crucified and risen Christ. So that is the product of worship. And so this morning, as, as, we, as we finish, as we leave, this week or this month, maybe this year, you're going to be confronted with the greatest lie that our culture tries to sell you, and that's the lie of self-fulfillment. 
the myth that you can follow, these dreams that you've established for yourself, and that's going to lead to infinite happiness in your life. It's that fiction that you can have it all in your life. You can achieve everything you want if you just, if you try harder, if you work a little bit more, if you get a little bit more organized, get a little bit more intentional, set higher goals, push yourself, try harder. You can, all those things are good in their proper context. They are good things. But if those things are driving you for some sort of happiness that you can accomplish apart from God, the result will be a life of no contentment, a life where you're never satisfied because you're always going to be searching for something else. You're always going to be searching for something more. You know, it's, it reminds me of uh, the words of St. Augustine. You know, you're, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. That's what that leads to. And the alternative to that life is found here in Acts chapter 2. It's the fundamental truth that you and I should live by in 2017, which is that to find the meaning of your life, that is only found in the triune God who gives you life. The meaning of your life is found in the triune God who gives you life. And that is the, the motive. That's the heartbeat of worship. And by doing that, you intentionally will reject the spiritual consumerism of our culture in, in 2017, and you're going to embrace a life that values the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit above everything else, above everyone else in your life. And so my prayer here is that we would live 2017 with a posture of worship, a posture of worship, knowing that you really are a broken sinner who falls short, as Paul says, of the glory of God. But you also know, you're not stopping there with that truth, you're also going to the spiritual truth that it, There is an infinite, transcendent God who gives you his peace. He gives you his mercy. He gives you his grace. He gives you himself through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. When you know that, your response to that truth is worship. And your response should be a lifestyle of worship, living the life God calls you to live. And and that's the most important truth this morning, that Really, all life is worship. It begins here on Sunday morning with God's people. It begins here with God's people around the the word of God, around the sacraments, around the prayers of God's people. It begins on Sunday, but it should overflow like a fountain, overflows into your week, into Monday, into Tuesday, into Wednesday. Worship begins your week, and worship should also fuel the activities, the actions, the life you lead Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, the rest of the week. And so it's, it's true biblical worship that takes us here from God's word to God's table, to the Lord's table, where we worship him and, and receive his sacrament. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that faith comes from hearing the word, as Paul says. We thank you also that you've given us this sacrament, which is a tangible way to Feed us on the gospel promises. And so we ask now, Holy Spirit, that you would use the bread, use the wine, use the juice to spiritually feed us and so that we would leave here strengthened in our faith, strengthened to lead a life of worship that begins today and and carries over into the rest of the week. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.